So I'm a little behind where I wanted to be, but nevertheless, we are, we are alive. Let me see here. Yes, we appear to actually be streaming. Mm -hmm. It all looks like it's happening. Okay, so tonight we have to decide. There's a lot to tackle with this floppy stuff um, now that we're actually getting back to it and doing it properly. So, yeah, got to pick them off one by one. So I don't think tonight will be that impressive or eventful. But the things that I have on my mind are, one, I actually have a floppy drive here um, that I should be able to plug into this board, and then that'll look real cool because we'll have a floppy drive plugged into an NES, even though it doesn't, you know, do anything. But uh, we should probably make that happen at some point if we're going to test, you know, doing commands on it at some point. Um, as well, I really need to figure out this reset pin situation and, uh, my Raspberry Pi that I had set up for, um, you know, toggling it last time around with a nice clean signal. Um, I, I took apart it at VCF for various reasons. So I think I might try getting that one bit register working again. I think my problem was before that, uh, I had wired up. I was setting bit zero on the bus when I had in fact accidentally wired the data input for that little one bit register up to bit two. Um, and that may have been all that was wrong there. So fingers crossed because uh, the reset signal again is not on the um, cartridge port and I really don't want to mod the NES. So that would be my preferred way to do it. So mm, probably gonna play with that a bit um, I also, let's see, I, I wrote this down in the description and I've already forgotten everything that I want to do. Oh, floppy drive needs power. Uh, NES does not have 12 volts on it, interestingly, and I don't think I'd want to load that NES's power supply with that kind of load anyway. So I have grabbed my slowly dying, uh, ATX supply that I use for powering random things. It does not have a floppy connector on it, so that's going to be a thing I have to do real quick is find a 12 volt and a 5 volt that are fine and then well, one thing that I can check real quick here is I should just be able to I mean this isn't ideal I would like to recognize that this is not how I would do this in a uh, in a finished thing but uh yeah regular headers go on there just fine so probably just you know solder up the right connections. I have to re-look up what pin goes to what, but hey Trey Dempsey, uh, good to see you post VCF. It was uh, fun seeing you in person. And yeah, good to have you. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting used to doing this a little bit later and my brain being sleepy, as I've said in a couple past streamy do's. Uh, anyway, hope you had a good time at, at VCF after I saw you. It was a pretty good one. Um, okay, so power for the floppy. Plugging in the floppy. Um, trying to get the reset register to actually, you know, read something off the bus. Uh, I feel like there was a fourth thing that I just thought of and forgot. Um, <laughs> oh, so here's the thing. One of the things that... Uh, so we've been trying to dump registers on the floppy disk controller, right? Um and there are a lot of registers described in the data sheet that aren't available to us on this right now because there is basically a pin on it. So this is this is for the PS2, uh, well, the PS2 used, the PS2 series used this chip. Um, but it has backwards compatibility for all the way back to AT, and we have it hardwired into AT mode right now. And that's why a bunch of these useful looking registers just aren't available to us. Um, but that should, that, that's as easy as uh, there is basically, like I said, there's a, there's a pin on there that just controls whether it's in AT mode or not. Cat hair. Uh, which I think is maybe this one. I'll have to double check. But just unsoldering five volts from that and connecting it to ground We'll have to check the data sheet, but I think that should be enough to uh, switch it into PS2 mode, which is actually what it should be in. I think I was just paranoid 
when I first built this board and I thought AP mode would be the simplest way to go. And I didn't realize, I don't think AP mode properly supports 1.44 megabyte floppies, or at least it's weird. Um, so anyway, clearly PS2 mode is the way that we should have it. And I think that's all I really need to do to do that. Then maybe we can poke with some other registers, but I don't think we'll really be doing any register poking today. So um, for starters, I guess let's get the semi-boring bit out of the way and solder up a power connector for this floppy drive. Also, one second, I'm going to go get a ribbon cable for the floppy drive. Not really necessary because we won't actually, you know, be uh, getting the floppy doing anything today. assuming I can find my floppy cable because I really only have like one of them and uh, I thought it was in a box with my other parts for the Pentium machine but hello David Walls hello hello I am not watching you but uh, my apologies for that hmm floppy cable. Oh well, hmm, I'm just going to ignore that part for now. Uh, yeah, try and look for it in my off time because we aren't going to be sending commands to the floppy. So, power tis. <laughs> I indeed have the token rod wired up. Okie dokie. So, I think I might also just go in here and do a little pruning because this power supply, I've been using it so long that it just has a bunch of, you know, loose bare wires and they could use a clip because it has started really being annoying to use what with everything always shorting out on everything all the time. So let's just give it a haircut. Guess heat up the soldering iron a little bit. Probably a good call. Which I I dropped I dropped the soldering iron brain moments before starting the stream, and thankfully it appears to have survived. But it was not pretty. going to leave the power on wire hooked up. In fact, you know, probably be a good move is just solder it together and I have some electrical tape. So I don't have heat shrink uh, convenient, but at the very least I could connect them together a little bit better and put some electrical tape on it so it doesn't short out and my life will be that much better. The iron says hot, which means it is time to go. Hmm. 
good enough. Oh, my favorite machine? <laughs> Shocking, says Trey. Brilliant. Just brilliant. This is why I keep you around. Um, yeah, my favorite machine is a tough call because I definitely usually have one, but it is changing all the time. Um, around the time that I made the Quadra video, um, I was really loving the Quadra. And then around the time I was doing VAC stuff, I really love the Vax. I do really like the Vax, uh, but I really like whatever I'm working on right now, so I'm I'm loving the NES at the moment. But like if I had to choose uh I I really like the 2GS just for its for its underdog uh cred, I guess. And it's just such a funky machine with a weird history and it's a dead end which makes it also interesting and I think GSOS is legitimately interesting to use uh, and it just makes me sad that there's not really a ton of good software for it like if people have there, there's I mean you know you can play any Apple II game on a 2GS but uh what I really want is games and stuff that that are 16-bit-ish in nature you know and actually use the extended feature set of the 2GS and there just don't seem to be a lot of good ones which is a super bummer because that means you know I don't have a lot of good reason to turn it on and play with stuff um, I, I legitimately really enjoy the Arkanoid port, port for it but yeah I, I love it but I, I rarely have a reason to turn it on these days not that I have a huge reason to turn on any of these machines because you know you collect them and then you play with them for a while and then you move on to the next one is how that tends to go. Because you just don't have enough time to enjoy all of your toys. Uh, okay, that seems pretty clean. Now let us get... We're gonna be, we're gonna be thorough. I need two grounds. I am gonna use a two grounds. There's one. Feels like this one is connected to something. Damn. Uh, there's two. That will work. I know. I know this is largely off screen. Sorry about that. I just don't have much room on this desk with uh, garbage. There's just a big garbage pile here. Uh, Nintendo, a keyboard, and that's pretty much it. I'm out of room. Anyhow. So here's a slightly wall. I'm going to use that. Sure. Seems good. Okay. So got a couple grounds here. Gonna make those the same length because it makes life easy. And 12 volts. Same deal. Ooh, pretty close too. Nice. And 5 volts. Hey, I chose the perfect ones. Doot. Okay, now. I need to remember what the frick the order of the uh, floppy power cable is. Is it is it the same as the regular Molex one, or is it upside down and backwards? Uh, floppy disk power connector. Desert Island. All this is interesting. What will last? Like, what of my computers will stay working the longest? Or what, what, uh, which ones have staying power? Not sure about the question. Okay, yes. So, uh, five volts is on the right. Do, 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 do. Where did I have that header? Oh, you know what I can do right now? Actually, here's what I'll do. I will 
chop up some of these things. And those will give me a more thorough connection and also be less prone to breakage. Yeah. If, until I get things swapped out. And actually they might they might just be good enough until I do get things swapped out. Like I said, apologies. This is uh, this is always the most boring part: is uh, <clears throat> cutting and soldering and soldering and cutting. Especially when I don't have a great topic off the top of my head to discuss. Uh, but I guess I can go back to that question: most reliable. I mean, like the older you go, the more reliable they get, pretty much across the board. Like Apple II's, very hard to kill an Apple II. I mean, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say very hard. You can kill an Apple II. It's not. I mean, you know, you can, you can, you can do it pretty trivially. But uh, you know, there's not much to break in them. So if they do break, they're pretty repairable. And then the later you go. I don't know that things get less reliable. They just get more complicated, you know? So there's more stuff to go wrong. So, like, even, you know, like an, an Apple 2C is going to be a little less standing the test of time than a, uh, uh, you know, an Apple 2E or something. And that's just the way it is. Also, there's the whole capacitors deal, which is, uh, you know, it's, I feel like common misconception that that's an age thing and, and capacitors do age, but, um, the capacitor issue was that there was a, basically a capacitor blight in the late nineties and early two thousands. So machines made around then, um, just have, have faulty capacitors that failed over time. So, like the, uh, there's stuff like refos and stuff that that just are notorious to fail. But otherwise, like components in an Apple II or a, a TRS-80 or you know, a, a older machine, they really don't fail that often. And especially on something simpler like an Apple II, because there's not again, there's not much to go wrong. Like if you get to a Commodore 64, uh, there's a bunch more custom chippage in there to you know there's the vic for the video and the the pla that's used for decoding the the memory space for the all the devices and that's just more likely to go wrong and then you also can't replace it but an apple 2 is the original apple 2 is all you know off the shelf parts so a pretty pretty reliable because uh you know they're used they were used and vetted by more groups than just uh than just the manufacturer of that machine and if you had to repair them you could you could find replacements fairly easily Oh, talking, talking, talking. I should have twisted these together before soldering them. Whoops. Oh, well. So that, that would be my opinion on that. Not really strong opinions. I don't... For, for the fact that I'm doing, like, an electronics streaming series, uh, I, don't, I don't repair stuff that often. I'm, I'm pretty bad at repair. Uh, just haven't done it that much, and I don't have the... Uh, like diagnostic vocabulary at this point so I can make stuff but I'm not great at figuring out why existing stuff isn't working right which is a shame let me read uh 
David said, did you make it to MWVC Fest? Uh, I'm guessing that's supposed to stand for Midwestern Vintage Computer. Computer, And that's uh, totally fine, if that's what you meant. But uh, to be pedantic, it is Vintage Computer Festival Midwest. Vintage Computer Festival is a whole, a whole community and like series of shows. So it's VCF and then Midwest is the Midwest one. Um, and yes, it was awesome. Um, if you look back at my channel, there are videos of it. And it was quite fun. And I met several people. But um, yeah, David Wall says, yeah, solid state, right? Um, I mean, ev everything, anything that's a that's an IC in your computer is is solid state. Uh, so floppies <laughs> to your to your next thing, no spinning hard drive. Floppies very unreliable. Floppies go bad fast, and floppy drives go bad often. But thankfully, like on the Apple II, they're very very simple devices. This is actually reminding me of floppies and uh, speaking about how I don't really fix anything. Um, one thing that is on my backlog is quite a while ago I got a I got a pretty decent eBay deal, um, which you know that's not saying that much because eBay deals aren't really a thing anymore. eBay is where you go when you just want the thing and you're just like fine, fine, fine. I'll 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 pay the money. I just I really do want it these days. Um, but anyway, got got a decent deal on uh, the Atari 800 that's sitting right behind me. Um, like a little over hundred bucks, and it, it the was the Atari and all the power supplies and a couple controllers and uh, disc drive and uh, like some some wild stuff like a, a copy of Visicalc for Atari. Um, so pr pretty decent deal, but and it was in like untested condition, right? So that's that's the only way you get the deals anymore. Which is why there's a whole scene of people repairing stuff now. Because, again, that's the only way to get a good eBay deal anymore. And it is what it is. But anyway, um, so the machine itself works okay. Uh, it's mechanically got some trouble spots, but it, it works fine. Um, but the floppy drive is not working. And that would be an interesting one to debug because... The Atari 800, just the, the Atari 8-bit series, um, like the Apple II has a ludicrously simple floppy mechanism. Um, the controller is a thing that barely exists. Uh, all of the all of the floppy routines are implemented. You know, 80% of it is 80, 80 or 90% of it really is done in software. Um, Whereas the Atari 8-bits actually use, um, like Commodore machines, they use a serial interface to talk to the drives, and the drives have a onboard processor that actually does all the work. So the Atari drive is actually a machine in its own right. So, a little more complicated to debug actually what's going wrong with that one but i think it's doable and i i have a logic analyzer now so um you know i can i can cheat now that should make things significantly more easy because i can see what the processor is actually doing and if it's if it's even trying to boot in the first place and then if it's trying to read the drive and and such, but I, I poked at it once and I was like, oh, no, I have no clue what I'm doing. So maybe that will be my first real repair project. But obviously, I have other stuff on my plate right now. This wire really doesn't want to solder up, and that's annoying because it just reminds me that I should have twisted these together, damn it. That seems fun. But yeah, that didn't really uh, answer anything towards spinning hard drive, just reminded me. Uh, I'd, I'd say a, a low mileage spinning drive at the moment, probably more reliable, though though harder to fix when it goes wrong, than uh, a random floppy drive from the early 80s. 
So also the I mean you know those those old floppy drives they hold up pretty well because they're mechanically pretty simple. And you can't really it, it is actually interesting. I want to play with this because there are you can repair some some spinning drives, particularly older ones. For instance, um, quantum SCSI drives from the late 80s of the kind that you would find in a Mac. Sorry, you can't see what I'm doing. I am just putting tape on these guys. Uh, apparently, they have a common problem where as they age, there's... Um, I think for those ones, it's the rubber pad that the head... Um, when the head retracts, it like hits a rubber pad so that it doesn't, you know, make horrible thwacking noises. It's either that or some kind of bearing surface of some sort, uh, but just kind of gums up over time because it, you know, the rubber breaks down. And if you are careful, apparently you can actually, it is possible to open those drives, uh, fix whatever the gunk issue is. Close them back up, and, and they can work again. Um, God knows how long, because, you know, if you're not in, like, a clean room environment, you are potentially, well, you are definitely introducing particulates into the interior of the drive, which will, you know, usually that air is super clean and filtered. So, but, I mean, when you have a drive that doesn't work at all, the fact that you can that you can do that, and I, I hear reports of it, it lasts long enough, and, you know, Decently long enough is what I was going for there. Um, that's interesting. But anyway, so I, I have some of those, and I don't know if that's the issue with some of the ones that I have, but worth a try. Worth at least cracking them open. But I gotta buy a Torx bit set, which I don't have. Like, I mean, of course I would have some Torx bits, but I don't have... I don't think I have exactly the ones required for that drive. Okay, so unless I did blow this uh, power supply up at some point and totally forgot about it, which is a real possibility, and something itches in the back of my head saying that I think I maybe did that, that's power for the floppy. Uh, now I just have to find... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep calling it a kettle plug cable because that's what I kept calling it at BCF and everybody said, you mean an IEC cable? And I said, yeah, I guess. But we're on my channel now, baby. And I'm going to call it a kettle plug. Trey Dempsey says, Stiction is pretty common. I fixed a stuck drive with a hairdryer. Neat, just like from the outside. Maybe I will try that first. Uh, oh, I forgot about that. Trey said, Curious Mark swapped a platter of an early classic Mac from one drive to another, um, and it worked briefly. I totally forgot about that. That was a cool one. That's all I have to say about that. And I totally forgot about it. Oh, Kidoki, here comes power. And I don't know if I really expect the drive to do anything on first power up. Uh, that sounded like a motor noise. That sounded like a motor noise to you guys? Because, like, it's not being told to do anything, so. That seems like power? I don't know. Since I can't find the floppy cable, we're just going to have to kind of put that one in the back pocket and say, there's a job that needed to be done, done, and move on. Because the, uh, like, there's no indication, the front LED doesn't even come on, uh, because that only turns on when you turn on the motor. So, until such a time as we can issue motor on commands, this goes in the pile. But ready to go at a moment's notice. Also note to myself, I should probably bridge the grounds on here and there. Because there is no ground pin going into this, so... Yeah, having different 5-volt levels is probably not 
It's a great idea. Or, you know, different different references. Hello, Daniel Rodriguez. And Trey says, yep, just heated the whole thing up from the outside and it spun up. Neat. Maybe I will try. I have to remember what drive it is now though. I have I have so those quantum drives are finally they're just going bad left and right. And I have at least one the first one that I need to do is uh there is a I have a drive that I accidentally deleted. What is it? I, I don't know enough about SCSI drives and Unix to remember, but basically like the the volume description block of the drive I deleted <laughs> at some point somehow and so I think the drive itself is fine uh, but I can't find anything that will everything reports hey there's no drive information block on this drive so I can't do anything with it and just kind of reports the drive as dead <laughs> so I don't know if that's something that I can actually fix but uh, first I need to find like a machine running BSD uh, I think is the only way that I'm going to be able to do that because it seems to be Unix and SCSI specific. <laughs> and uh, so maybe I can try running BSD on my Quadra 700 or something, but it needs to it needs to have uh, you know SCSI one board on it um, or any kind of SCSI board, but I because uh, they should all be backwards compatible. But I don't have anything better than that, so. The super block. No, not the super block. Because that's the that's the first block of the file system. And it's it's above the file system. It's a block that like describes drive information, not like volume information. Uh, it was because I'm trying to remember, I think it might have been an Erix file system that I had on there. And I tried I tried zeroing the drive and it really didn't like that. And it's not just Erix that can't read it. It's like in general, even if I stick it in a Mac, it doesn't. It's like this drive is not only shit, but uh, I can't even wipe it. Um, no, it's not. It's not the drive label either. I can't remember because it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense to me because it seems like it's not like a file system related thing. It seems like it's a SCSI information related thing. So. I don't know. I don't know enough about SCSI drives. Uh, anyway, what was the next thing? So we got power. That's cool. Um, I guess we were going to get the floppy plugged in, but that's not going to happen right now. Um, maybe get the one bit register dealio work mulling. I already forgot the four things that I set up top, so I guess I'll just do that. And if I remember what the hell it was. Oh, the, yeah, resoldering that too. Uh, actually, the iron's hot right now, so I guess I'll just do that. Let us look at the data sheet. Which is going to be a pain in the ass to look up again, because it was on bit savers or something, and it took me a second to find the first time, for some dumb reason. Uh, it is an AT... no, it is a 82077SL. 82077SL data sheet. Oh, there you go. That was easy. <laughs> David asks, what's the high level objective on this project? And oh David, if you if you only knew what a what a poor question that is. It's a pretty pointless project. I'm just strapping things under the side of an NES for fun. Make it into a a boring home computer. Uh, ideally, at some point here, I want to point, port Microsoft Basic to it, but that's kind of gotten sidelined by trying to hook up the floppy drive. But I did say in the very intro to this project, um, being able to like boot off of some kind of disk is one of the things that makes something very computer-ish to me or PC-ish. So I'm happy pushing forward with the with the floppy drive because uh, it would just be you know cool to be able to boot software off of the floppy drive pretty much um and i was i was reminded at vcf because i was saying you know one thing that we could do is just set things up so that basic boots off the floppy drive and it's just a, a booter program um and then i was reminded that you have to load basic into memory and i have 
I think, 8K of SRAM on this Super Mario cartridge because it has, uh, like, an extension RAM on it, which is nice, uh, and 2K on board. And I was reminded that um, I think Basic itself is, like, 8 or 10K. So I would be out of memory once I loaded it off of the floppy. Uh, so I might have to add more memory somehow, which would be difficult because they would have to all be bank switched. Uh, or have it on the ROM. So maybe if possible, we'll put it on the ROM and we'll have we'll have basic and a bootloader. And if the bootloader doesn't find anything on the disk, we fall back to basic, probably. Anyway, it's just a, it's to make an NES into a computer for no good reason. Uh, coding projects and stuff says, that's not stupid, that's cool. No, it, it can be both. <laughs> Trust me, that's, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Um, Dave says, either way, I like it. Thank you. Uh, bu -bu 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 <laughs> Daniel Rodriguez says, I'll get some snacks to watch this. Uh, go for it. I haven't been going that long, so you, you still have a little bit. Dirt Piper says, every time I watch you working on this, I need to force down the urge to try and port Minecraft to the NES. How? Actually, you know what you should do? There was a... Uh, I need to get back to working, but... Um, I wish I could remember the name of this guy, because he also... He's on YouTube, and he also does basically nothing but really nonsense projects. Uh, better, better and more nonsensical than mine. And uh, he did a project ages ago where he... Um, basically put a Raspberry Pi into an NES cartridge and uh, steals the bus from the NES to... Or no, it doesn't even... Uh, so because the NES reads the tile set from the cartridge, I believe his Raspberry Pi basically simulates being uh, the character ROM. And so as the NES draws the screen, he just sets up the screen to be, you know, all of the available tiles um, filling the entire screen, and then updates them on the fly to just render arbitrary graphics into onto the NES's screen. Uh, and he, so he was running a SNES emulator on the Raspberry Pi and rendering it through the, the NES. Uh, anyway, doing that, I, I, you could do Minecraft that way. That's all I'm trying to get at. Yeah, 2D, 2D Minecraft would, would be neat as well. Dirt Piper says, and then I'm going to get back to it, uh, was mucking around with my Octane a lot today. It's finally cool enough to not cook myself to death running it. Uh, I'm a big fan of fall, so just thanks for the reminder that fall is coming back around again. Uh, Got to get back to work on the OpenJDK port. There's not a... There's not an Irix OpenJDK, like, build... I would assume that, like, people on the, the NECAWARE project would be maintaining some kind of Java. Uh, yes, Dirt Piper said, reverse emulating the NES to give it superpowers. That is the one if you want to search YouTube. That is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Trey said, I saw a Tezzero VCF so want. Yeah, there were at least two, maybe three. And uh, the Tezzero used to be at the top of my list, but at this point, it's just you're never, ever ever going to get a Tezro. I do not want... Either those people had Tezros like from years ago because even even years ago Tezros were hard to get and expensive. And uh, I mean now like they just don't show up. They're crazy. So if they, if they bought them recently those people are psychos. Good for them. Uh, I hope it didn't drain all of their savings but uh, yeah. But now I'm back into like being into the, the old guys again. I would love... I, I've talked to, to JP about this before because I, I haven't talked to JP in a while. Um, but if anybody knows JP Kiwi Geek, um, I, I'm on a, a talking relationship with him. Um, and I have told him I really want his, uh, his Terminator... Uh, which one is it? Uh, now you've got Octane in my head and that's all I can think of. Onyx. He has a, a Terminator Onyx, the one that's in a... Uh, 16 inch rack and I always really wanted one of those and, and he has one and they're just lovely uh, and I don't think even he has a Tezro I don't think JP has everything and I don't think he has a Tezro uh, yeah Turnpiper says okay 
Professor Kagan, Kagan, the professor says, Minecraft was made by the creator of, oh, Minecraft. Minecraft was made by the creator of Minecraft. It's 2D Minecraft. Yeah, yeah. And Dirt Piper says, Tezzer was way a ton and cost a ton. Truth. Um, Trey says, I sold my Octane 2 and Fire. I'm out of the SGI game at this point. Uh, I think the stream just went funky. Did the stream just go funky? I wasn't looking at the right monitor. Anyway, I'm going to keep talking. Um, yeah, I, I had an Octane. I sold that. Uh, but I got I got a, an O2 and the personal iris for, for free, which never happens. So holding on to those. Dirt Piper says even fuels are hard to get. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's just all of it. SGI stuff just disappeared off of eBay like seven years ago. Just gone. Uh, fuel. Yes, they're fuels, not fires. Give me fuel. Give me fire. Give me that which I desire. People have so much stuff in storage. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> That's David, you, you're not wrong. That does happen, but for that, for that stuff, people have either already sold it to people who will never give it away or, <laughs> you know, are already people who will never give it away. So it is what it is. The SGI scene is pretty pretty calcified at this point. So I'm glad I have I have what I have. Uh, okay, so <laughs> now that I am done catching up on all that, which I mean, you know, that's important. I'm doing a stream here. Gotta gotta keep up with the with the fans. Uh, I need to confirm it's the ident pin, which is on 27, which is catty corner from the notch so yes it is the one that I thought it was so the annoying thing here is uh, if you can kind of see I have power going from what I believe is an actual power pin jumping to the uh, ident pin and then going over to another power pin so hmm. <laughs> oh god no that actually goes under this under this little capacitor that I put in here at some point and, hmm, yeah, we're just going to have to do some rerouting here. Uh, yeah, huh. Well, I will just unsolder those two power connections and deal with what I have at, after that point. And it doesn't matter because I probably won't even know till tomorrow if it worked because I'm not really planning on reading any floppy registers tonight. Yes, annoying. So, like, this this wire right here, I just should just remove entirely, because that's the one that was going to the, uh, to the ident pin, but uh, there's really no good way to get at it now. Hmm, hmm. I'm just gonna clip it, and we will never talk about this again. There we go. That will be our little secret. And then maybe, is this long enough that I can just run this over to where the other power lines are here? Could be, might be. Let's glob up a crap ton of solder on this pin. And yeah. That seems to have vaguely generally worked. Okay, and then I need to now connect that pin, which of course I've forgotten which one it was. Probably should have marked it in some way. I think I know what it is, but I don't trust myself. Let's beep it out. Anybody ready to make a beep? Doot! 
Doot. And this is always really fun to do. Because there's no really good way to just like connect a probe to the front side of these pins. So you got to just kind of hold it sideways. There's probably a thing for that. I don't know. Hey, yeah, I'm glad I checked because I was about to solder to the wrong pin. So I know this one goes to ground for sure for PS2 mode, but... I am not sure. There's also another pin for, uh, it's called the MB, or uh, not MBR, that is not the right thing, uh, MFM? Yes, the MFM pin, and I think, I'm pretty sure it's floating right now, and I think it's okay if it floats, but the mode is selected using this pin and that, that MFM pin. MFM slash FM pin, and I will have to double check that as well. But firstly, I am scanning my desk to try and find a piece of black wire. That will work. No, that will not work. That will never work. <laughs> Let's not steal from my jumper wires again would be lame. I am tempted to just like use a resistor leg because there's there's ground right next to it. I know this is all tiny and you cannot see it on the on the screen so sorry 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 but I'm going for it. I just really hope I can do this without bridging connections to the adjacent pins. I think I may have gotten away with it. And maybe I'm super lucky and they're like no connects or something. I don't know about this. I don't know about this. Okay, what pins are around there? What am I potentially dealing with? Na, 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 na. Data rate index? Hmm. Might be okay. Might not. Let me just... I guess I should describe for you what I'm doing. And instead of running it kind of alongside the pin, I think I will try bopping it onto the top of the pin, so I'm not running alongside the other pins, and I think that will work. Where to put my solder? There to put my solder. Sure, that looks reasonable. Whatever. What do we care? What do we even care? Okay, so now the question is, going back to the documentation, uh, let's see, let's read about the ident pin. I think this is just the world's craziest, heaviest PDF because nothing else makes this machine, which isn't an amazing machine, but it's a halfway decent machine, chug like, uh, like scrolling through this document. Okay, so that ident pin, uh, if it is zero, and the MFM is one or no connect, it's in PS2 mode, cool. So that should be fine. And it would not have been this because I would not have wired it up for illegal mode. <laughs> so I think we're fine. I think we can get away with this. Very good, very good. All right, so next step is, I guess I will get this all plugged back in and such. Uh, make sure I plug in the right cable. Yes, the one with Sharpie on there, indicating pin zero, or pin one. My life is an off by one error. Okay. 
log on in, my friend. You as well. And let's just see if this is booting right now. I'm gonna turn off the iron because I think we're done. Which again guarantees that in about five minutes I will need that iron again. And let's get the RCA capture actually doing things. Yubity doop. Uh huh. That is stale because the NES is off right now. So I'm kind of guessing that is not up to date. Uh, yes, AV to USB cable. Let's go with that. And cool, we're all good. All set. So let me double check now in my my softest of wares. Let's get WinCoople up. Everybody loves Coople, the world's best programming language. And it is what project is it? ROM FDC memory. And let me see if the code for the register is even still there. Uh, we still have a, an output for FDC reset. And it still seems to be set here. So maybe I will just try this test again. Let me see. The other thing I have to check is in my code. Am I still? Okay, so this was my this was my toggle code right here. So supposedly that register is set up at C thousand. And yes, the code for mapping that to C thousand is theoretically still there. So I think let us just uncomment this stuff really quick because it looks like I never took that out of there so that should be on the chip right now and the LED is still hooked up to it so I'm not gonna mess with it too hard and in fact let me look because one of my things I was wondering is let's see I had the clock well I had the clock pin hooked up to chip select, which I think is fine because in a 6502 bus cycle, um, there is, there is, data is expected on a read to still be on the bus, like at the end of the cycle. And then there is a brief delay where it's allowed to remain on the bus before it has to get off. And so it's right there when the cycle is ending that you can sample it. So I would assume that when it's the NES is writing the uh, end of the chip select would be a good time to sample the bus. So uh, a high on chip select, since chip select is inverted, happens at the end of the chip select, you know, time. So I would think that would be a fine time to sample the bus. And I think I was just sending it the wrong datas. And it looks like ship select is still connected to clock so let me just make sure no it's connected directly to clock so before i was i was inverting it but it's physically connected to clock right now so there is no inversion happening before it gets there so i feel okay about it now let me let me double check that the data pin is still wired up i don't know why i would have changed that but do do, do that was on pin 15. Wait. No. The data input. Which I did relabel D2. Nice. Smart. I already knew. Yes. Right. D2. Uh huh. So. Yeah. Either this, either this equation is totally wrong. Or it's just because I'm writing a 1 there. So it never never changes but that okay so the data is supposed to be coming in on pin six sorry you weren't looking at my screen uh just trust me with everything that i said so one two uh, one thing one two 
three, four, five, six. Yeah, that looks like the right thing. Yep, I feel fairly confident. Either the the uh, watch my who's it equation is totally wrong, or yeah, I don't think it it would work regardless if I if I wasn't sending it to and if I was only sending it to pin zero. So let's fix that, and then we will let me get you back to my desk, Rob. And then we will uh, build this and try again. Do, 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 do. So I could just I could just do FF and flip the whole thing back and forth. Yeah, let's just do that. Let's just do that. Just to be absolutely positively positively absolutely sure. Lovely, lovely. All right, let's. Cool, that is the right chip still. Let us load basic.bin. It's already there. Super cool. Okay, I think there's a fly on my goddamn face. Go for it. Right. Boy, whoever whoever told me to use a zip socket. Smart person. And oh, I should probably bring this onto the screen. Okay. So, this guy is actually positioned kind of nicely. Um, currently on, interestingly. Hmm. And if I type a key, no toggling, yay! Super great. Super, 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 super duper cool. Uh, I mean, I guess one thing I can check is if it's... Uh, because it could be, I mean, it, it, it's it's not the data pin at this point, because I'm flopping FFs to it, so it should be flipping on and off, because I am exclusive oring the thing. Let me, let me, just scanning really quick to see if there is an obvious way that I am screwing that up at all. Yeah, so I push a zero onto the stack, and then I pull it. Zor it with a literal FF, and then store it and push it back onto the stack. So, yeah, that should be alternating. Could be that my decode is not right. Could be a bunch of things. So maybe what I will just do is make it... make it just automatically invert its own value for right now if that address is accessed. And then that'll at least tell us if the, uh, if it's that the data isn't being picked up at the right time or something weird. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Well, let's just see. So let's go over to WinCoupol and comment out this shit. And actually also make sure it's not something really, really, really stupid, like it's not even on the right pin. That would be very funny. FTC reset is on 15. So. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15. No, it's right, damn it. Damn it. Why couldn't you have just been wrong? Make my life so much easier. Uh, anyway, 
So I guess oh, apparently you can't do a comment like that. Let's just do FDC reset equals. Ooh, you know what's one thing that we can totally do is to see if it's the MMC3 mapping. So I, uh, as I was talking to myself about what I can test, I realized that, you know, I can't just have it be the, the chip enable uh, at all times causing it to change its value because then it would just be f f going crazy because the ROM is being accessed all the time at, at you know, 2 or 4 megahertz or whatever it is. Uh, and I thought to myself, that sucks because the uh, address decoding is a really important part. But you know what we know is decoded and that we write to every time we press a key is the floppy drive uh, controller. And I have, I have things for that. So I guess, let me see. So it would basically be, this pin should be like its subsequent value will be if FDC chip enable B. So if FDC chip enable B is uh, high, then that means it's not, it's not asserted because it's an active low signal. So if that is the case, then it will just be the previous value of FDC preset. And otherwise, if FDC CED is in fact being decoded, then, ooh, also we have to get the read write working here because we actually are getting a read signal somewhere and we're running it to the chip, I think. And right now this is just gonna to toggle on any access to that memory address, but we really would like to be able to write to that chip. So yeah, uh, we will do that tomorrow though. For right now, let's see if we can toggle this freaking thing. So anyway, if it is, uh, if chip enable for the floppy area is asserted, then we will, oh God. Okay, so I have to think about this. Let's do a truth table, because this is very easy. Uh, CB and, come on, come on. And FDC reset, so zero, zero, one, one, the next value, or if the current value is zero, one, zero, one. So our output, uh, if chip enable is zero and FTC reset is zero, then we want the new value of FTC reset to be one. Same thing here, if it's one, we want it to be zero. And then in either of these cases, we want it to retain its value. So, Yes. All right, that is something. Anyway, let's just uh, do a product of sums on that. So for zero, zero, so that is FDC chip enable B, uh, and no, sorry. Not, not FDC chip enable B, and not FDC reset, or the other one is this bottom one, and that is just the exact opposite thing. I bet you could simplify the living hell out of this thing, and I'm not going to. I just want the thing that definitely works.
Cool. Fancy. So that should just cause it to flop anytime the floppy area is accessed. So that is a good, like, starting point to at least make sure things are connected up right. And yeah, if it will do this, then I think I will do the same thing, but for we'll replace floppy drive chip enable B with the uh, the signals for this thing. I guess we'll call it single reset register chip enable. Uh, anyway, so we'll just do the same thing, I guess, without the chip enable signal, because that's already kind of implied by the fact that this is clocked by chip enable. And... Da, 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 da. Yeah, try again. And if it works with the one and not the other, then that shows that our MMC3 mapping is not working the way that we expect it to. So let me kill power before I break everything. Device dependent compile. And also we've been going for a little over an hour, so I will do this check. We will see what the result is. And then uh, we will probably just move into tomorrow. Because I don't want to keep these too long on the weekdays. Or I, in fact, am attempting to have somewhat of a life. Okay, that built. Very good. Super cool. So which this yet again back to ATF 16B8B. Cool, cool. And nope, that's not what I meant to do. Load. Da 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 da. Rom FTC mapper.jed, which was in fact built today at 10.06. Cool. That is the right one. And I guess we should probably go ahead and get this out of the board or something. Might be a good call. Probably putting it in the programmer. Gonna really help with the programming. I don't know. You tell me. Sound out. Sound off in the comments below. Program it. Jam those bits in. You can do it. Yay, I always believed in you. Okie dokie. So, every time this tries to access the floppy, whether it be a read or whether it be a write, I will be expecting this thing to flip and flop and flop and flip. Sorry, I was just thinking through things to see if there was any major obvious logical dumbassery that I was doing, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Let's find out. It's on, but it would start up in an arbitrary state, so yeah. Okay, so that much. I am very happy to say, in fact, works correctly. Yay! Um, so now, I guess, let me try the next step. I'll go ahead and try the next step since this is relatively fast. And the next step would be updating this so that, uh, let's see, so not A17 and A18 is the addressing for this guy. So what happens if we replace FTC chip enable B with, uh, like, let's just literally replace it very conservatively with this. Same thing over here. And again, I bet you could simplify the living hell out of this. And I'm not 
going to. And hmm. <laughs> Cause I mean the the deal is right now, if this if I do this and it keeps working, I guess I have a fairly good uh indication that uh It's, it's working the way I expect, and it's properly decoding the C-1000 area. But mm. without looking at the signals, it doesn't prove it. Maybe there's still something stupid. I, I'm overthinking it. Let's just run this, and we'll see what it does, because my gut feeling is it's probably not going to work. I feel like it's not going to work. Sorry, all the, I'm kind of talking to myself, because two things happen every time we press this key. One, we're doing the... Uh, right to C1000 to flip and flop the value of this thing. And we're doing a read from the floppy controller. So we're accessing both areas. So... I mean, I, I have clearly made a change here. This clearly does not match the floppy controller area, which is A17 and A18, both being zero. So I feel I feel okay about it. I feel okay about the assumptions I'm making here in testing this thing. So, yeah, I guess let's program. I guess that's the only thing left for us to do. Let me build this again because I'm paranoid. And also, I can't remember what I was doing three seconds ago. So, it's just it's just a security precaution. Okie dokie. Let's yank that bad boy again. Unfortunately, I'm out of ZIF sockets. So, what are you going to do? At least this one should, in theory, get reprogrammed far less than the than the EEPROM is going to. Once I have the uh, decoding and this reset register thingy working, I should never have to touch this again. There we go. You would do. Progra doop. Go. Thank you for going. You did a great job at. Okay, and whichever way this this goes, I'm gonna gonna call it there and go sleepy time Betty bye. Uh, read read chat, then go sleepy time Betty bye because I have seen a lot of action out of the corner of my eye. Uh, right, I'm just good to go, right? Yeah, yes. Welp, that is fairly damning. Because if it didn't work, that means. It doesn't work, <laughs> which is good in a way because that leaves me without any hesitation in knowing uh, decode is not working properly. So pretty clear probably the MMC3 mapping stuff that I'm doing to try and uh, make sure that C1000 maps to uh, A17 low, A18 high is wrong -o. So we will have to visit that tomorrow. We will we will look at making sure I have the MMC3 set up correctly, but there you go. There it is. And now I'm going to read chat, and then I'm going to go to bed. See you. See you, see you, see you. My goodness, I even have to scroll a little bit. You guys, you guys, come on. Too much. Okay, so the last thing Dirt Piper said was nope. Uh, Trey said... Oh yeah, I saw that right right at the end of our last talk sesh. I couldn't give away my son E450, but my fuel sold instantly. I am surprised. When were you selling it? Because I feel like now, I mean, son anything is going to go. Uh, David said, back to twerk. Indeed. Uh, Trey said, decoupling caps? No. Uh, no. Um, 
generally I find when you're working at this low speed, I have never had a realistic need for decoupling caps. Things just don't get noisy enough, um, which is surprising considering how, how scrambly pambly this board is. Like it, it probably does reduce the margin of, uh, uh, safe operation, you know, that where you can guarantee that it operates the way you expect it to by a fair bit, but I, I've never had a problem. Um, higher speeds, you'd probably want to. And for like a shift project, you would definitely want to, to guarantee that your uh, transients don't, uh, you know, cause your chip to reset itself because all of a sudden it's out of power. Uh, Derek says, I actually attempted my first fab live stream this afternoon. Oh, or lab live stream, sorry. Dang it. Had I known, Derek, I would have put you on in the background while I was working. Um, says I should probably do more, but I'm not going to live stream all my lab work. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, what I'm doing is kind of insane. The fact that I'm not that, you know, putting in an hour of work every day is to, to unwind and whatnot. That part's not weird. Uh, Putting it on the internet every single night is a little bit crazy, so I don't blame you. Uh, we we had beeps from Trade MC. I appreciate that. I know I should have been looking at the time, but beep indeed. Um, Derek's talking about his streaming. He says, I also need to figure out how to video stream my bench instruments. But pointing a camera at them is too fiddly for the situation. Yeah, that's why I, I don't even try to go like with a decent setup here, because firstly, I, I'm not trying to like turn heads or anything. I just do it because I felt like it, and... Uh, so, like, when I was doing the the logic analyzer, it was terrible. Uh, the refresh was not lining up with the camera at all, and it was literally just a webcam pointed at the screen of a logic analyzer, and that, that was what it was. I'm sure there are better ways to do that. Like, if I got another DSLR and set the, you know, the actual frame rate to match, yeah, you can do that, but that's another, you know, 200, 300 bucks I don't really feel like spending. But good luck on your, on your, uh, setup and figuring those out oh he says they all have web interfaces but that's too clunky to overlay and they don't all update fast enough to be interesting uh i mean you can also just i, I think it wouldn't be that bad to just let things hang out like especially if it's going to be a relevant signal um you know just like leave it in the corner and i don't know i don't know what i'm talking about i, I don't know that i can advise anything because as you can see i literally just like leave obs <laughs> uh areas windows uh, video elements just like off screen and then just drag them on and it's all very higgledy piggledy so don't listen to me uh <laughs> david said i'm subscribing who's with me nes computers shall take over the world i don't know about that i appreciate your enthusiasm um and i appreciate the the sub um you will help me make an extra two cents this month uh, the Corrupted Bit says, I've dreamed about doing this kind of stuff before, restoring functions to devices that don't really have a reason not to have them. Props to you for actually getting something done or trying to. Uh, I appreciate that I'm living someone's dream. As, this is why I decided to stream these at all, is I know there's got to be, like, at least, you know, three people out in the world who <laughs> thought about this before. Um, I mean, it's just something that, you know, like, the Dreamcast has a keyboard. Apparently the Saturn has a keyboard, which I didn't know until last weekend. Uh frickin' there's a PS2 keyboard. There's a GameCube keyboard. All of those things just make you go, yeah, but can it run DOS? I don't know why. It always did for me when I was a kid. Like, the fact, just the fact that, like, you can plug a keyboard into a console was just tweaked my brain enough that, I don't know, it's led to this moment. Um, Timmy Dirty Right. God, there's a lot of random people in here. Uh, random in a good way. Like, not not the usual faces I see. Which, of course, I love the usual faces, but it's interesting to see people I don't know pop in. Uh, oh, Timmy Dirty Rat says, was awesome to see this demonstrated at VCF. Definitely following this project. I appreciate it. Um, as I've said before, I highly recommend don't try catching up. There's, there's too much. Skim here and there. But uh, Dirt Piper said good night. Uh, I'm sorry I missed saying good night to you, sir. Uh, Trey Dempsey, cheers. Oh, he said, I sold in 2014. I could see. That seems like right on that cusp where... If it's big, heavy shit, you could have trouble getting getting rid of it. Uh, I feel like right now, like a, any any sun, anything, especially uh, something like an, an E series, something. I feel like it would go. Uh, oh, corrupted bit asks where the keyboard is pulled from. Um, <laughs> I 
I, I, you're not wrong as far as it having a story. I just, I don't know how interesting it is. Uh, for the Brazilians' time, not your fault, just I want to preface that because people have heard this a bunch. It's from a TI-99 4A. I also got asked this a lot at BCF, so don't worry about it. Uh, it's from a TI-99 4A. Lots of people noticed. No backspace key, which is going to be fun. Um, actually, I, I don't think Microsoft Basic is really going to need a backspace key. Probably doesn't support it, but um, regardless, for other purposes, we'll probably want one. Or, you know, something like that. And Timmy, Timmy Dirty Rat said TI-99 4A. Um, and yeah, the, the story that is there is that, um, I bought a TI-99 4A, I think in 2009, 2009 or 2010, where, when it was, you know, dirt cheap. I don't know what they go for now. I think they're still pretty, pretty reasonable, but, um, and then I don't remember why I took it apart in the first place, but I sure did. And then I just never really put it back together. And all of the parts sat in a box for a long time. And then I moved. And I don't know what happened to the other parts. <laughs> Full story. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, Dirt Piper says you didn't. Good, good. Well, uh, good, good night. I don't know if you were saying good night to me because I was quitting, but uh, either way. And Santiago... Uh, says, I'm reverse engineering a PLC module that has an ADC-186. I've already done an ADC-188 single board computer based off a modem that I've already reverse engineered. So it's nice to listen to your streams while doing this. Um, <laughs> that's definitely more advanced than what I'm doing now, but it's cool to, to hear about your project. Uh, PLC is in like programmable logic controller. Oh, okay. That makes more, more sense to me. I don't know why I was, I was thinking of like a PLA and I was like, there's a, a PLA with like an 8186 core on it? No, it's a it's a PLC, programmable, programmable logic controller with a 186 on it. Um, interesting. Is the difference between a 186 and a 188 like the difference between an 8086 and an 8088? Because I've never, I didn't realize that that would be a thing, but it kind of makes sense. Anyway, I find uh, 186 is another one of those processors that I find super interesting because it was not used in anything i mean it was used in like a lot of embedded stuff but like its reason for existing is super marginal wasn't in any pcs so i like that it's kind of a red-headed stepchild so points for that um trade mc is is uh greeting the other people as well yeah santiago said yeah the industrial things old as hell though i imagine it would be because it's a 186 um the Corrupted Bit says, I subbed from the old 6502 single board computer video because I thought, this is the kind of cool stuff I want to do as a hobby one day. Uh, I just have to absorb a few years of electrical engineering first. Um, I'll tell you, this kind of stuff is relatively easy because all I'm, like, digital logic, you can't really go wrong. It's like a more complicated version of, uh, you know, plugging AV equipment together, really. Um, when you're dealing with like lower speed devices like this, like signal integrity and noise are like not really a problem or a thing to be concerned about. So it's mostly like looking up data sheets, figuring out what signals come out of where and plugging them together and seeing if it works really. Um, yeah, don't, don't necessarily need an electrical engineer degree for this. And that's, uh, I'm glad that that's one of the videos that blew up because I kind of gave a weird pep talk at the end where I was talking about how like, if you're interested, you should just go do it um, or like, you know, start by like grabbing some, uh, 7,400 series logic chips and just playing with them and having fun that way. Uh, cause they can be fun to play with like Lego bricks and you will slowly realize that it's all, you know, it, it can get, it gets complicated by the nature of having a lot of signals and a lot of things to control, but it, it's really not that bad. Like, it's not like electrical engineering. Electrical engineering gets insane. This is just simple digital hackery it's easier than you think not that it's trivial but it's it's easier than you think so go for it is all i'm saying there uh santiago says yep same differences between the 188 and 186 so thank you for uh clearing that um oh. <laughs> timmy says i also subbed from the 6502 video uh and had no idea you were the same guy at vcf until after that's pretty good um yeah there was at least one guy who was, he walked up and he was like, I didn't realize I was subbed to you until I got a message that you were streaming. <laughs> and 
I think he probably saw me walking around or something. So that was pretty funny. And then he came over to chat with me. So good times. Um, all right, guys. With that, stop sending me chats or I'm going to keep reading them. And uh, y'all get some sleep, uh, assuming you're in relatively near time zones to me. And I will see you guys tomorrow for more shenanigans and trying to get this, this to work, which I think is just just MMC mapper stuff that I'm doing wrong. So good night, y'all. I will see you on the next day. See ya. I love ya. Bye-bye. <laughs>